needs to happen quickly and in a very big bite. We wait to see whether President Trump will be taking such a bite when he meets with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un in just five days' time. I'll be discussing that further with our expert guest in the studio later. But first, we start with the latest headlines with Devin Whiting at the News Centre. Devin? Hi, Jango. South Korean President Moon Jae-in and the Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi, held a bilateral summit this morning. The two leaders vowed to strengthen their country's special strategic partnership through more concrete cooperation. Our Blue House correspondent, Hwang Ojun, reports. Children waving flags, an inspection of the honor guard. A proper red carpet welcome for a leader the South Korean president calls a friend and a brother. President Moon Jae-in and his Indian counterpart, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, met Friday at the Blue House for about an hour. After that, they signed multiple MOUs and then held a joint press conference where the two leaders declared their resolution to strengthen their country's ties. To promote human and cultural exchanges between the two countries, the Indian government has decided to extend the period of stay allowed for Korean citizens in India up to three years from the current 12 months. Seoul, on the other hand, is looking to open a new collective tourist visa program for Indian nationals. And to emphasize their historical ties, both countries will jointly issue a commemorative stamp of Hoangwuk, the queen of the founding ruler of Korea's ancient Kaya kingdom, who is believed by many to have come from India. Regarding their economic partnership, President Moon and Prime Minister Modi noted that the two countries' trade volume reached an all-time high of 21.5 billion U.S. dollars last year, and they agreed to continue to boost bilateral economic cooperation with the goal to reaching 50 billion dollars in trade volume by 2030. To that end, the two leaders will work to quickly conclude negotiations on the Korea-India Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Also, bilateral collaboration can be expected in fields related to the fourth industrial revolution, green energy, and even the space industry, while the two countries also encourage exchanges between each other startups. Last but not least, President Moon and Prime Minister Modi pledged to work closely to establish peace and prosperity in the region, not just the Korean Peninsula. They also decided to further promote strategic cooperation in national defense and the defense industry, while also reinforcing joint efforts to cope with transnational crimes such as terrorism. President Moon hosted a state luncheon afterwards in honor of the visiting Indian Prime Minister, the first world leader to make a state visit to South Korea so far this year. Hwang Woo-jun, Arirang News. The nuclear envoys of North Korea and the U.S. are in Hanoi continuing to fine-tune the details of a summit declaration for their leaders to sign next week. This morning, North Korea's Special Representative for U.S. Affairs, Kim hyuk chul and two other North Korean delegates went to the hotel in Hanoi where U.S. Special Representative for North Korea, Stephen Began, is staying. Kim and Began met yesterday at the same hotel for over four hours. The key talking point is believed to be North Korea permanently dismantling its nuclear complex at Yongbyon and having that verified. In return, the U.S. is likely to suggest exchanging liaison offices, formally ending the Korean War and easing sanctions on the regime. An unnamed senior U.S. government official told reporters on Thursday that the immediate priority is to freeze all of North Korea's weapons of mass destruction and missile programs. Meanwhile, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is insisting there will be no compromise on the goal of North Korea's complete denuclearization. In an interview with U.S. network NBC on Thursday, Pompeo said the regime's complete denuclearization is still the main objective. Pompeo refused to say what the U.S. might offer in exchange, reaffirming that sanctions will not be lifted unless the North gives up its nukes. Though Pompeo also seemed to say that might still be a long shot, in a separate interview with Fox Business Network, he noted that the fall of the Berlin Wall 30 years ago was unexpected on the day it happened, and he hopes one day the world wakes up to a moment like that. Now, there are officials from both sides already in Hanoi, and when the leaders themselves get there, more will come with them. Our Kan hyung takes a look at who those officials are. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and U.S. President Donald Trump will surely be the faces of the upcoming Hanoi summit, grabbing all the limelight. 
But it's their respective support teams that have led and will continue to hold working-level talks in the run-up to the summit. Similar to the Singapore summit last June, Vice Chairman of the Workers' Party of Korea Kim Young-chul and U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo will serve as the top advisors for Kim Jong-un and President Trump, respectively. North Korea's Minister of Foreign Affairs Lee Yong ho and U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton will also again play a key role at the Hanoi summit. But in regards to pre-summit negotiations, there have been personnel changes on both sides. North Korea's former ambassador to Spain Kim yok chul has replaced the regime's vice foreign minister Choi son -hee. U.S. Special Representative for North Korea Stephen Began has also taken over the role served by the U.S. Ambassador to the Philippines Song Kim in the run-up to the first summit. Photos suggest Kim yok chul and Began are the negotiation channels that directly report to their respective leaders. Both Kim and Began have met each other's leaders face to face, indicating their messages have been clearly exchanged and understood. With no experience in leading North Korea US negotiations, the pair are under pressure to break out of the unfruitful patterns seen over the past decades. The world will have to wait to see what kind of agreement comes out of the Hanoi summit, but the outcome could determine whether the pairing of Kim yok chul and Stephen Began will still be in place if President Trump and Kim Jong-un meet for a third time in the future. Kan Yong-ho, Arirang News. In other news, South Korea's total household credit, which includes loans and credit card debt, increased at a slower pace in the fourth quarter last year. According to the Bank of Korea on Friday, total household debt in the October to December period was around 1.36 trillion U.S. dollars. That's an increase of 5.8 percent on year, but the rate of growth has now fallen for eight consecutive quarters. The central bank attributed the slower growth to government policies aimed at easing the household debt problem, such as the introduction of stricter loan screening. The U.S. and China have resumed high-level trade talks in Washington aimed at ending their trade war. They called a truce late last year, but if they don't reach a deal by early March, there'll be new tariffs. Noah Adam has this report. There are reports both sides are drawing up multiple MOUs that would form the basis of a final trade deal. Though we have to wait until Friday before any official announcement is made, the latest reports suggest the two countries are beginning to make some progress toward ending their near seven-month trade war. Previous negotiations have all ended without an agreement as Beijing resists most of the Trump administration's demands. But as an early March deadline on fresh tariffs loom, both sides seem to be picking up steam. Extending that deadline is also being considered. U.S. media are reporting that negotiators are working on six MOUs that would cover areas including agriculture, non-tariff barriers, services, technology transfer and intellectual property. This would be just a broad outline of what could make up a deal, but any major agreement will not likely come out after this week's talks. China's Commerce Ministry has declined to comment on the MOUs. U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer and Chinese Vice Premier Liu He are also yet to give any details of their first day of negotiations. No Adam, Arirang News. I'm Devin Whiting, and those are your news headlines. As mentioned earlier, the top nuclear negotiators of Pyongyang and Washington are continuing talks in Hanoi to hammer out the details for their leaders' summit declaration. Meanwhile, a U.S. official has said bold steps need to be taken quickly on North Korea's denuclearization. Uh, oh Jung-hee has the latest details. Talks continue between North Korea and the U.S. and Vietnam to fine-tune the details of the Hanoi summit declaration. On Friday morning, North Korea Special Representative for U.S. Affairs Kim hyuk chul went to the Hotel du Park Hanoi, where U.S. Special Representative for North Korea Stephen Began is staying. He was accompanied by two other North Korean delegates, Kim Song hye who heads the United Front Department Strategy Office, and Choi kang Il, the Acting Director General for the Foreign Ministry's Department on North Korean Affairs. 
Kim and Began had met on Thursday for over four hours at the same hotel. The core talking point is believed to be the verified shutdown of the North's Yongbyon nuclear complex, the key site where it produces plutonium and uranium for nuclear weapons. In return, the U.S. is likely to suggest exchanging liaison offices, formally ending the Korean War and easing sanctions on the regime. The two sides are expected to continue meeting until the very last minute. In Seoul's nuclear envoy, Lee Do-hun could also be seeing Begin time to time, as he arrived in Hanoi on Friday as well. While the final coordination is tight, Washington is urging Pyongyang to take big and bold denuclearization measures. A senior U.S. government official told reporters on Thursday that for North Korea and the U.S., it's crucial to move quickly with, quote, very big bites, and should the regime make the right choice, it'll get all the necessary incentives. He said Washington is still not sure if Pyongyang has really chosen to denuclearize, but is engaged in the ongoing talks because there is a possibility. The immediate priority for now, says the official, is to freeze all of North Korea's weapons of mass destruction and missile programs. The regime will also need to provide a full inventory of its nuclear arsenal, quote, well before the end of the denuclearization process. Oh jung Arirang News. For more, we have joining us today Dr. James Kim, a research fellow at the Asan Institute for Policy Studies. It's good to have you back on the show. Nice to see you again, Zhang So let's start with the latter half of that report we just heard there. Very big bites. That's what an unnamed senior U.S. official told reporters how he thinks uh, the North Korea denuclearization process needs to go. But at the same time, he also said that the immediate priority is to freeze all of North Korea's uh, nuclear weapons programs. So can a, North, uh, can a nuclear uh, freeze be considered a, quote, big bite for now? Well, I think we are, we're already there. Um, we've had a freeze on the tests and developments for the past year, a little over a year. Um, some, some experts argue that there's no need for further tests because um, they're done developing. Uh, but um, if we mean by freeze uh, further proliferation, the creation of new weapons, um, then, then I think it's meaningful um, if they could try to somehow see through that second part, which is on the proliferation side. Again, it requires some inspection and mm. some verification. And I'm not exactly sure how they're going to do that. Mm. I mean, so do you think it can be this, the, the framework is there for that to be achieved uh, in the meeting next week? Um, I, I'm, again, I'm not clear, but at the moment, there aren't any encouraging signs. They've only had about two uh, or three working level meetings, and a lot of that was devoted to logistics behind the second summit. Um, I'm not sure where there was a time for the negotiators to talk about a lot of these very, very difficult issues. So um, it's not clear to me that, um, that we're going to see substantive outcomes on, in, those, in that regard. Um, at the next summit, but in the follow-up to um, in the follow-up meetings um, after next summit, we could hope for some more uh, better better results. But for now, there aren't any encouraging signs, and that's not to say that we won't be uh, we won't be getting any good surprising news um, after the summit. Uh, so let's hope for the best. Mm. Before we move on to the negotiations that are currently taking place in Hanoi, let me just stick with what the U.S. official also said as well, that he said uh, the U.S. will eventually need a full inventory of North Korea's nuclear ars arsenal well before the full denuclearization. So he seems to be laying out uh, pretty much what the Washington wants out of this process for denuclearization, a nuclear freeze, a list of uh, North Korea's uh, nuclear arsenal, and then dismantlement. Does that seem like the order that they're going for right now? Well, that's been the order for the past year again. Um, there isn't any change there. Uh, but um, Secretary Pompeo um, has stated uh, recently in some of his recent statements that the goal really is to go as far as they can. And um, I, I believe the administration is a little bit more open um, to other possibilities. So while that's the preferred step, um, if North Korea is not willing to play by that rule, then uh, Washington is willing to consider what they have to offer. Mm. 
Let's go to that summit, uh, so to the negotiations that are taking place. So North Korean and U.S. officials are meeting uh, in Hanoi. Uh, they have been for the last couple of days, and we're guessing they're going to continue meeting as, as they prepare for the summit uh, next week. They are thought to be you know, hashing out the details for the declaration itself. But as we said, there's only a few days left. I mean, what can they... What can we expect? What can they achieve during this time? Um, yeah, it's, it's just not clear to me that how they're going to work through a lot of these difficult issues um, in a matter of days or hours that they're meeting together. Uh, but again, um, we, could, we have to hope for the best and, and see what we get um, when President Trump meets with Kim Jong-un. Uh, but for now, um, these signs are not that encouraging. This isn't how normally like these kind of diplomatic events work, is it? I mean, we saw it in the last event as well, but uh, last summit. But normally, there are weeks of negotiation, months of negotiations <laughs> before they reach this uh, agreement on declaration, whereas now they seem to be drafting it together in a room on a piece of paper. Right. I mean, if you recall the last working level meeting, which was the first meeting between Kim yok chara and Steve Began, um, it was after the first meeting. Uh, President Trump basically came out and said, we're doing the second summit. Um, so I, I'm not sure there was much time for the negotiators to do their work um, before that announcement was made. Uh, but again, if it, this is not a bottom-up approach, but if it's a top-down approach, we might see some surprises um, come 27th or 28th. Mm. We just heard as well in that report that the South Korean nuclear envoy, Lee do -hun, is also now in Hanoi and will also be uh, either joining the talks or being briefed by uh, the, his U.S. counterpart. But we'll see what happens there. But what does that mean? What does that show, the fact that South Korea's nuclear envoy is also there in, uh, in Hanoi? Lee do is probably not sitting in the room uh, with Kim young chul and Steve Began while that negotiation is taking place. Uh, but there's good chemistry between Steve Began and Lee do -hun. Um, through the working level meetings and consultative sessions that they've had uh, on this issue. Um, and I think it shows good chemistry between those two um, officials. Uh, it shows also that there's close coordination, at least or appearance of close coordination uh, between United States and South Korea as they move forward on this matter. Um, so overall, I think this could be on the one hand, it's public diplomacy. On the other hand, um, there could be some interesting you know, inputs that Lee do can give uh, to Steve Began um, if uh, he requires some more additional information about North Korea's true intentions. Uh, maybe South Korea has some, some information that Steve Began does not have um, while he's talking to Kim Yok-chul in that room. So um, any additional input is useful, um, but you hold out again. Um, I don't think Lee do is really playing a, a, a central role in these discussions. But Idohun's presence in Hanoi leads to speculation that uh, the U.S. and North Korea might be discussing the end of declaration to uh, uh, an agreement to end uh, the Korean War. Do you think there might be a possibility that there might be progress on that? Uh, there's always possibility there, um, given that it is not something that uh, is required from the U.S. side in terms of sanctions relief. Um, so outside of sanctions relief, all these are possible. There's been talks about. Uh, potential liaison offices being opened um, in respective capitals, um, and and this is another issue um, about end of declaration, end of war declaration. So um, all of these um, are, are up for grabs. The question here is uh, number one, uh, what does North Korea have to offer, and number two, what are both sides willing to trade for, uh, whatever the other side is offering. Mm. It was originally announced that President Trump and Kim Jong-un would be meeting over two days, February 27th and 28th. But U.S. officials have told reporters that the meeting will be similar in format to the Singapore summit. And that's led to speculation that uh, the two leaders might only sit down for uh, one day of summit talks and maybe have like a dinner on the first day, but not two days uh, long discussions. I mean, do you think that could happen? And what does it mean if... Uh, President Trump and Kim Jong-un only meet to have summit talks for one day? Um, it probably means that there isn't much to talk about. Um, and again, those are not encouraging signs. Uh, but, you know, we could be in for a surprise on come 27th or 28th. Uh, maybe both men um, have other things to tend to. Um, so they need to end that meeting early. Um, there are some signals um, about North Korea's uh, plans after the talks. There may be um, follow-up meetings uh, in Beijing uh, and or Moscow. 
Um, and, and, and so, you know, um, there are a lot of moving pieces here. Uh, we don't want to jump to any conclusions, but certainly it's not encouraging when, uh, you know, the previous discussion was that this was going to be a two-day uh, meeting, but now, you know, it, there's a potential here for this being only a, a, a one-day meeting. So um, these are not, again, these aren't encouraging, but um, you hope for the best. Mm. We'll have to see whether it is two days of summits or whether they're just meeting for dinner on the first day. The first summit in Singapore had huge significance because, of course, it was the first ever meeting between uh, any of the leaders of uh, North Korea and the US. Even the handshake alone was a historic moment. Next week's meeting will be hard to live up to that. I mean, so would you agree that the pressure is on still for significant progress to be made in the contents of the agreement that the two sides uh, agree on? I, I believe so. I think Kim Jong-un wants something on the sanctions side. Uh, President Trump um, is facing increasing pressure from scrutiny uh, within uh, the Democratic Party, is um, uh, within Congress, um, is, is playing the role of um, um, a check on the president's ability um, to see through a good deal here. Um, on the other hand, we're also seeing within the administration there are some possible cle cleavages there and disagreements. So the president um, needs to produce some results here to convince um, these naysayers that um, he's, he's got something really meaningful here going on with North Korea. Um, and uh, same thing with Kim Jong-un. Kim Jong-un needs to show that um, these meetings are producing some results uh, for the elites within Pyongyang. Um, if he's not able to win sanctions relief, then um, uh, it's not clear to um, these, uh, everybody in Pyongyang or, uh, for that matter, in Beijing or Moscow, why he's uh, continuing to talk with uh, President Trump. Hmm. Let's now turn to some other interesting news that's coming out as well. It's been reported that the U.S. National Security Advisor, John Bolton, will be coming to South Korea this week and uh, ahead of the uh, summit next uh, week. But his reputation as a hawk raises various questions about why he's visiting now. I mean, why do you think he's visiting? Well, first of all, um, Steve Began, who is typically um, um, leading this effort, um, is in Vietnam. Um, so um, any meetings that he could have uh, at the working level uh, with South Korea to coordinate on negotiations with North Korea, he's not able to do that physically. Um, secondly, um, the National Security Council within the White House is the point for White House on, on this meeting. So it's just natural that it be someone uh, within the NSC. Usually it's been um, someone like uh, Matt Pottinger um, or Alison Hooker who took the lead role on this. But it seems to me that um, they're placing high priority here and, and John Bolton uh, wants, to, um, wants to take um, some measurable steps in this regard. Um, the, thirdly, um, they're sending a really strong message here to North Korea that they need to, uh, to you know, offer something that's meaningful. Mm. Um, otherwise, there's Bolton here that's waiting in the wings, um, and he doesn't like uh, uh, all this uh, time wasting going on with, uh, with these negotiations. Um, so um, it's not only uh, coordination with South Korea, but also some signals that they're sending to Pyongyang, um, a, a slight nudge, if you will. Um, to get them to offer up something meaningful for the U.S. Mm. And final last uh, uh, point I want to uh, look at as well. South Korea's unification ministry has confirmed that Pyongyang has rejected Seoul's request for North Korea to jointly take part in the March 1st uh, independence movement uh, 100-year anniversary celebrations. Now, you know, South Korea has been looking to have this kind of joint event for some time, but do you think this signals uh, anything towards the outcomes of the North Korea-U.S. summit, or is that something separate uh, that they, they, we can consider for now? It's possible um, that um, North Korea is signaling that there isn't going to be much coming out here uh, of this summit, and they don't want any follow-up meetings with South Korea on other matters. Uh, but it's also possible that Kim Jong-un has uh, other things lined up um, right after the summit, namely, as I mentioned, a visit to Beijing possibly and or a meeting with Vladimir Putin. Uh, so um, we probably shouldn't jump to any conclusions here, uh, but um, it certainly um, isn't really um, encouraging um, on, on that end either. Mm. Well, that's where we have to wrap things up. Thank you for coming in today and sharing us your insights. Thanks for having me.
And that is where we'll close out our show. Our newscast throughout the weekend will keep you updated on the latest from Hanoi. We'll also be bringing you full comprehensive coverage of that North Korea-US summit next week. So do tune in then. Thank you for watching and hope you have a great weekend. Goodbye.